On July 16, 1854, she was running late to play the organ at the First Colored Congregational Church on 2nd Avenue and East 6th Street. And Jennings and her friend Sarah Adams decided to take a streetcar, which were horse cars pulled by horses running on rails. And the conductor threw her off. She fought back. She was no lame, limp lady, although she was very respectable and very genteel. She hung onto the window shaft, uh, sashes. She was kicking and struggling. They dragged her off the platform and turned her upside down so her head was almost on the street. Her injuries were so bad she couldn't even go to the meeting to raise money in the church the next week based on uh, her mistreatment by this conductor. So she took the Third Avenue Railroad system to court. And the, uh, this is an example of the horse cars. Oh my god, they weighed like 3,500 pounds, those poor horses. Uh, Frederick Douglass wrote about this uh, very soon after it happened. Um, and the various people that I'm going to mention in the course of the next few minutes are an indication of the degree to which there was a powerful network 100 years before Rosa Parks, as probably most of you in this room know. There were lots of movements to try to desegregate the uh, public railways, the streetcars and the railroads. In fact, Elizabeth Jennings' brother had already been really manhandled on a railroad near Salem, Massachusetts. He was a dental student up in Boston, and he rode in a white car. So um, Elizabeth Jennings took him to court. Eliz uh, Frederick Douglass uh, said that uh, the case was an outrage on colored persons. He was following this stuff and reporting on it carefully in Frederick Douglass's paper, as was the National Anti-Slavery Standard edited by Sidney Gay, also known to people as uh, one of the influential ones in New York Vigilance Committee, Underground Railroad. So Horace Greeley, who's been mentioned here before in the New York Tribune, said that when the case went, went to court, she got upon one of the company's cars last summer on the Sabbath to ride to church. The conductor undertook to get her off, first alleging the car was full. When that was shown to be false, he pretended the other passengers were displeased at her presence. But when she insisted on her rights, he took hold of her by force to expel her. The conductor said something extremely rude at the time. You shall sweat for this. Sweat was really nasty. You know that women only glow or perspire. So, um, so another person, uh, she was not alone in this endeavor, uh, in bringing this case. The Reverend James W.C. Pennington, a prominent preacher to several congregations, from the Shiloh First Colored Presbyterian Church, which was down on Prince Street, and later moved uptown. And he was a pastor of a congregational church in Brooklyn. He also uh, ministered to black congregations in Long Island and Hoboken. So as you can imagine, with those congregations all over the tri-state area, this is a guy who's taking public transportation all the time. So not only was he somebody very interested in achieving black rights, he was personally being affected all the time. He was thrown off the uh, ferry at um, the Fulton Ferry, actually, when he was on his way to preach in Brooklyn one time. Um, so uh, this court case then was the, taken to the court in Brooklyn, uh, and uh, this is actually the same courthouse, which, of course, I had to take the picture because I work around the corner. Um, and uh, she actually won her case because the judge uh, instructed the jury that the Third Avenue Railway System was actually, oops, I turned it off. Ah, the Third Avenue Railway System, that's their logo there, and those are examples of the horse cars, uh, was based in Brooklyn, so that's why she could bring it in Brooklyn court. And of course, if any of you have fought the power in the American legal system, you know it really makes a difference where you bring your case. So they actually did, did a smart thing to put it before a Brooklyn judge in this case. So we told the jury that the streetcars were common carriers, and therefore they must carry everybody. She had sued for $500. Her lawyer was someone who, as an American historian, I knew absolutely nothing about. He has 
he was a president. His name was Chester Arthur, and I never thought anything about him at all until I stumbled on the Jennings case, and I said, wow, he actually did something. He was 24 years old. It was long before he became president. He only became president because the guy in front of him got assassinated, but, you know, whatever. Um, so Arthur brought the case for 500 bucks. The jury decided in her favor, but then um, they weaseled it down to $225 because they were very unsure that a respectable colored person deserved to have $500. Um, everybody always asks, you know, how much is that really? And all I can say is in terms of the day, Elizabeth Jennings was not only a church organist, she was a teacher, and her yearly salary was $225. So that gives you an example of, you know, it may not sound like much, it's less than she deserved. However, it was a year's salary, so not too bad. <laughs> so this brings up, the Jennings case, brings up the whole um, issue of where does the segregation struggle fit into the overall abolitionist movement? After all, slavery had ended in the North in 1827 already. So here's Pennington, uh, himself uh, uh, had been a self-liberated person, AKA fugitive slave. He, with Elizabeth Jennings' father, Thomas Jennings, founded the Legal Rights Association to pursue not just the Jennings case, but also many other cases which, alas, they were correctly predicting would occur. Jennings, the father of Elizabeth, was someone who was well prepared to take action on injustice. As Blair Murphy Kelly writes in Right to Ride, and this is a book that I recommend since people are recommending books from the podium here, <laughs> recommending places to visit and sources to check. So Right to Ride is a, a very cool book that came out in 2010 that's about all the other uh, transportation boycotts we don't know so much about. And the first chapter deals with Jennings and Pennington being thrown off various transportation and even uh, Elizabeth Jennings' brother, the dentist William Jennings, and so on. So anyway, with the help of uh, prominent New Yorkers, Thomas Jennington, uh, Jennings and Reverend Pennington formed the Legal Rights Association, and uh, they took the case to trial, and they won. Now, um, Chester Arthur, who I'd mentioned in a somewhat unflattering way, but what the heck, if you can't rough up the presidents, you don't deserve to be in a democracy. <laughs> so um, Arthur, in, a, in, in his further back credentials that I discovered, had also worked with John Jay II. And uh, this was an interesting case as well, that it, it also illustrates the uh, realm of uh, the network of various activities that people were engaged in. So one of Arthur's cases uh, before he took the Jennings case was helping John Jay II, who did a lot of work on emancipation cases and a lot of things later under the fugitive slave law he was working to uh, get people out. He helped John Jay file a habeas corpus p petition to free eight slaves who were brought by Jonathan Lemon, a southern slaveholder, to New York. So these were people who were held in slavery, but they were brought to New York with their so-called master. And um, the network of the Black Vigilance Committee of New York was very into finding out about these sort of things and saying, you know, guys, do you know that you're in a free state now? We will help you get away. So Louis Napoleon, who worked with Sidney Gay and the New York Vigilance Committee, actually um, you know, told them, uh, let, let's leave. They, they took them away, and then at the legal level, John Jay and, and uh, Chester Arthur um, took this case. So anyway, that's some of these characters all working together in this network of activism that had to do with fights for equality, fights for justice, fights for voting rights, which were mentioned in Weeksville, um, and challenges to both the law and to social custom. And that's one of the things that I really like about this transportation case, is that because it's something happening out in the public sphere, it's very, very visible violence against people of African descent. And the fact that this violence is visible, on the one hand, tells you how common and acceptable it was to perpetrate violence on people who are marginalized. But on the other hand, it tells you why 
these smart strategists of the mid-19th century were taking action on things like segregated transportation, even while they were meeting in anti-slavery conventions and um, trying to secure the right to vote and doing all kinds of other things too. So um, Reverend Pennington, 